Good afternoon, everyone. The American Diabetes Association welcomes you to our virtual Safe at School workshop. We're so glad that you're here. I wanna let you all know that we are recording this session and a link to this session will be soon made available on ADA's website and our social media platforms. I am Crystal Woodward, National Director of ADA Safe at School Program. I am also the mom of the daughter with type one diabetes so I understand and have firsthand experience with the challenges and concerns about diabetes management at school. Today, I have the honor and pleasure of co-presenting with my friend, Dr. Fran Kogan, who is the medical director of the Child and Adolescent Diabetes Program of the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism at Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. Dr. Kogan is also a professor in pediatrics at George Washington University School of Medicine. In addition, she partnered with the Washington Nationals as a major league baseball team, the Washington Nationals Dream Foundation Diabetes Initiative, and led efforts to build a state-of-the-art diabetes care complex at Children's National Hospital in 2013. And I just want to give a shout out to all of our friends at Children's National Hospital today. Dr. Kogan is also a member of the association Safe at School Working Group, which is our advisory group for Safe at School. The first half of this afternoon session will provide an overview of Safe at School, typical diabetes management challenges faced by students with diabetes, and federal and state legal protections with diabetes addressing these challenges. We'll also briefly touch upon essential written plans like the Diabetes Medical Management Plan in Section 504, and we'll let you know how to access ADA's many tools and resources. The second half of today's program will provide guidance and tips on how you can advocate for your patients in the school setting. We'll talk about ADA's new DMMP and how to use it and we'll cover technology in the school setting and what you can do to help schools with training school staff. We'll also talk about COVID-19 and diabetes in the school setting. Welcome and thank you, Dr. Kogan. There will be time for questions and answers after the first half of the presentation, and then again at the conclusion of our program. So please type your questions in the Q&A box. Now let's get started. Today's program will cover a Safe at School overview, legal protections for children with diabetes, written plans. Uh, I'll talk about recent Safe at School successes and what we're working on now. The role of the diabetes provider as advocate, current technologies, treatment therapies at school, and training of school personnel. And then we'll talk about um, the many resources ADA has available on its website. And now we're gonna take a poll just to find out where everyone's from. Thank you for um, indicating your state in the chat box, but if you could uh, let us know which part of the country you're joining us from today, we'd really appreciate it. Just give this a couple more seconds. Wow, we've got a variety. Still coming in, it's exciting. Okay, so it looks like right now, um, most of the folks are from the Midwest followed by the Northeast and then the Southeast, Southwest and Northwest, so welcome. Safe at School Principles. ADA's Safe at School campaign is based on three principles of diabetes management in the school setting. First, all school staff members need to have basic knowledge of diabetes and know who to contact for help. And this means the specials teachers, the um, food service folks, um, even, even the janitors, anyone who interfaces with that student with diabetes needs to have some basic knowledge. The school nurse is the primary provider of diabetes care. 
but other school personnel should be trained to perform diabetes care tasks when the school nurse is not present. So we know that even the full-time school nurse can't be in all places at all times. So there should be a small group of other school staff who have been trained to meet the student's diabetes needs. Students should be permitted to provide self-care whenever they are at school or school-related events. And of course, this applies to students who have the skill level and the uh, maturity level to do so. These principles are endorsed by these organizations. These are organizations that agree with us um, on those three principles and who have been very supportive of Safe at School. So what are some of the goals? Um, schools adhering to Safe at School principles are best positioned to achieve these goals and to ensure the safety of your patients while they are at school. Um, as healthcare providers, you know it's important for your patients to have their diabetes management needs met to keep them safe and healthy in the classroom. And at all school sponsored events and activities, including field trips, uh, varsity sports, after school chess club. Um, so here are three goals for school diabetes care while at school. Schools must provide a medically safe environment for students with diabetes, and this means there must be trained personnel who can respond to diabetes emergencies and provide routine care, such as insulin administration. Students with diabetes must have the same access to educational opportunities and related activities as, these, as their peers. So for example, a student with diabetes cannot be told they can't go on a field trip um, because mom or dad can't come along to take care of their diabetes. Uh, it's up to the school to provide a school nurse or other trained staff, staff to accompany students on field trips. Schools must work with the parent and guardian and, and the student to support transition to independence because we know that eventually um, these children will need to be independent in their diabetes management. What does discrimination look like at school? Um, so uh, there is discrimination in the school setting. Um, that's what our legal advocacy division that falls under ag advocacy division, we work hard to fight discrimination and safe at school fights discrimination in the school setting. So it's when parents are required to come to school to give insulin or provide other diabetes care. Schools that don't have a school nurse or they don't have trained school staff members to provide care when a school nurse can't be there. It's when students are told they can't go on field trips unless a parent comes along. Um, another example is when student athletes aren't able to safely participate in school sports or other after school activities because schools refuse to provide trained coaches or other staff. Students who are denied smartphone access to manage diabetes. Um, and also another example is students who are denied the opportunity to take an exam at an alternate time if they are hypoglycemic or, or hyperglycemic. These are all examples of discrimination and maybe you heard some of this from your patients. Um, I feel like I'm skipping a slide here, here we go. Um, so, you know, have no fear, there are federal and state laws that provide protections for students with diabetes. Uh, the key word to keep in mind here when it comes to these federal laws is disability. Uh, diabetes is a disability because it is a physical impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. I know that's a mouthful but it's a physical impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. And in particular um, with diabetes, that major life activity is endocrine function. So there are three federal laws, um, basic laws, the Americans with Disabilities Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act. In addition to federal laws, there are state laws, regulations, and guidelines. Um, so these laws do work to help level the playing field for the student with diabetes 
and ensure a safe and fair environment for your patients. So here's just a brief overview of federal legal protections for students with diabetes. Uh, I urge you to go to ADA's website at diabetes.org forward slash fed laws to learn more about these laws. Um, but these are federal laws that provide protections to your patients. The first is section 504. Public and private schools receiving federal funds have legal obligations to provide services, i.e. diabetes care under 504. Um, and talking about that definition of disability, diabetes substantially limits a number of major life activities, including walking, talking, eating, endocrine function. And that major life activity need not be learning in order for a student to be eligible for services under 504. Um, so for students who are who qualify for services under 504, the family uh, should work with the school to develop what's called a 504 plan. I'm sure that most of you have heard of that. And we'll talk about a 504 plan in a couple minutes. The Americans with Disabilities Act applies the same way as section 504, but it also applies to daycares, camps, and recreational programs. Religious operated programs do not have legal obligations to provide care under ADA. However, if that religious operated entity does receive government funding, they may have legal obligations under Section 504 to provide services and diabetes care to those students. And then with um, IDA, IDA uh, this is a special education law. And under IDEA, it must be demonstrated that the diabetes or another disability adversely impacts the student's ability to learn and to progress academically. Um, however, if diabetes does um, already adversely and significantly in, in and of itself impact the child's ability to learn, that child may qualify for services under IDEA. And then rather than creating a 504 plan, that student would have what's called an individualized education program or IEP. In addition to federal laws, there are state laws and regulations that apply to the care of children with diabetes in the school setting. And it can be really confusing. Every state has its own laws. They vary um, on who may provide care at school, their education codes, their Good Samaritan laws, there's Board of Nursing regulations. So unfortunately, there's often no statewide policy, rather the policy is determined district by district. So that, you know, that just adds to the confusion. Um, some states have developed school diabetes management guidelines, and you could check out the association's website at diabetes.org forward slash fed laws to see if your state has um, any kind of guideline document that it's put together. Um, based on both federal and the laws in your state. Many states have these, but just know that regardless of state law, the requirements of federal law must always be met. And what this means is if your patient attends school in a state where only a school nurse is allowed to provide diabetes care, then the school nurse must be available at all times, not just for a few hours during the day, must be available to take care of kids on field trips and at extracurricular activities. So it's important to know um, what your state law says and if it allows the school nurse to delegate or if it allows um, other school staff to be trained to provide diabetes care, including insulin administration. So, um, some states have passed specific school diabetes care laws or changed relevant board of nursing regulations to enable trained school staff members to provide care to your patients. And again, um, you can learn more about the state's laws by going to uh, diabetes.org 
forward slash fed laws. Lots of good information there. So, um, you know, we've been in this global pandemic for two years and um, it really has, I don't need to tell you, it's really thrown a monkey wrench into everything, including um, attending school, I should say, you know, especially attending school. But what you need to know is that students with diabetes have legal rights that do not go away, did not go away during the global pandemic. Um, students still work with the school to put together 504 plans with all the accommodations in the 504 plans. Um, the diabetes medical management plan or physician's orders were still needed. There were just a, a lot of adjustments that were made but the legal rights of the student did not go away. Um, again, the students still needed an IEP or 504, other written accommodations plan, whether they were doing in-person, virtual, or hybrid. And I know now most of the kids are back um, to the brick and mortar buildings, which is really good. Students with diabetes, even during a global can, uh, pandemic, cannot be excluded from school-sponsored activities because of their diabetes. Individual assessment to determine what goes into that 504 plan is still required. And um, we're always reminding families and the schools that we need to remain open-minded and reasonable to adapt to the changes and the precautionary measures um, required uh, when we're working uh, under COVID-19. So you may know that the association recently updated its diabetes medical management plan. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank um, the members of our Safe at School Working Group who led the effort on this plan. It's really quite remarkable. Um, Dr. Kogan is going to talk more about this plan in a few minutes. I know that um, some states, schools, uh, diabetes practices have their own versions of the DMMP, but it's really the hope of ADA that this new um, DMMP will be adopted and utilized nationwide. We're developing some training resources to go along with it, some how to use, how to navigate. Um, so we're really hoping that you take a look at it and, and that you will um, adopt it for, for your practices. But no matter which form of the plan is used, it's just important to make sure that all aspects of diabetes management at school are addressed and included and align with ADA's DMMP. And then the other plan I mentioned is the Section 504 plan. Uh, which is a written document where the schools uh, and the families agree on the services and modifications needed by the student. The plan is individualized because we know that every student with diabetes is different and has different needs. Um, and also the DMMP or the physician's order is uh, serves as the basis for writing the Section 504 plan. So the, the DMMP um, is important for this for the development of the plan, but the DMNP or the physician's orders is not a substitute for a 504 plan. Um, we really, we need both. We need both the DMNP and the written accommodations plan or the 504 plan. Here are some typical provisions included in a, a 504 plan. As again, it's all individualized and this is just a, a list of uh, typical accommodations that are, are included in a 504 plan. And then um, with COVID, uh, we came up with some recommendations and actually these are some, um, also some examples of what, um, in addition to the regular provisions, what else might be included. But we, as always, we recommend um, to check the Centers for Disease Control for their latest recommendations because we know that uh, those recommendations are frequently updated, um, but require three feet physical distinct, distancing between the students, facial covering based on the latest government policies, which have changed a lot, and so on and so forth. Um, so there are some specific COVID pro provisions to be included in the, uh, the 504 plan. 
So the key takeaways to ensure a safe and health, healthy school environment for your patients are just, just some actions that you can take to make sure your patients are safe at school. Uh, make sure your patient's treatment plan or DMMP, make sure it's current, make sure it's complete, make sure it's signed. Um, be sure that it contains specific schedules and orders for the frequency of giving insulin, current insulin dosages, and insulin to carb ratios, of course. Uh, be a resource for schools, including providing training to school nurses and other school staff. Many training resources are available on ADA's website at diabetes.org forward slash SAS training. Um, provide input as needed to develop the education plans like 504 IEP. Provide a prompt response to school's inquiries about your patient. We know that you're all busy, but I know, you know we also know how important it is to answer the questions that come to you from the school nurse. Communicate with the family um, to make needed adjustments and to address concerns and encourage the families, of course, to follow current CDC COVID-19 recommendations. And it's, it's helpful too for you to be knowledgeable about the various school district policies for the patients in your practice. Here are some of the Safe at School resources uh, that are available online. Um, it's not pictured here, but we do have our school training modules, which we are um, in the process of updating. And that's a resource that consists of a number of PowerPoint training modules that a school nurse or diabetes educator can use to train lay school personnel. So be on the lookout for that being updated. Um, so just concluding my part of the presentation, just wanted to make you aware of some recent Safe at School successes and what we're working on now. You may have heard um, uh, our, in our uh, litigation against New York City um, public schools, the court recently issued an order on the association's motion for summary judgment requiring New York City public schools to train its bus drivers in glucagon and also to establish a, um, a pool of um, school nurses to accompany students with diabetes on field trips. So just stay tuned for that one. There are some more um, the de developments that will come from that um, soon. We, um, as I mentioned, we just uh, finished the updating the diabetes medical management plan and we are working on some supplemental resources to, to help providers and school nurses and parents to better navigate um, the plan and to, to streamline the process for completing the plan. Um, ADA is working on updating a school guide. The school guide is the former National Diabetes Education Program school guide. So we expect that update to be done this summer in time for back to school. And we are also working on um, an online school nurse training uh, that will provide continuing education credit for school nurses who complete the training. So. Lots of uh, good work, a lot of good things happening, a lot of good things continue to happen um, as we all work hard, continue to work hard to get together to make sure children with diabetes have their needs met at school and to make sure that they are treated fairly. And now I'm gonna turn the program over to Dr. Kogan, who will talk to us about the diabetes provider as an advocate. Dr. Kogan? Hi there, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I wanna thank uh, Crystal for the opportunity to work with you today. And I wanted to um, just say what, we're, what my role is, is what many of your roles are, which is to act as your advocate for your students with diabetes. Crystal? Mm -hmm. So um, basically, just to review what Crystal had to say and, and um, narrowing it down for the provider, which includes, when we say the provider, I'm including everyone, that being the um, healthcare team, meaning physicians, nurse practitioners, diabetes educators, dietitians, et cetera, to be involved as advocates. 
The DMMP is basically the cornerstone for your, your patients. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, about um, providing the um, incredible amounts of information that go into the form. Um, the, as Crystal mentioned, the DMMP is the um, basis for the 504 team. Not everyone will ask for a 504 plan, but we believe that it's a good idea to um, request the 504 plan before starting school when everyone is on a very positive note that it should not be adversarial. Um, we hope that all of us as healthcare providers and diabetes team members act as a training resource for school nurses and staff. And as Crystal has mentioned, we uh, believe that it, the school nurse is not the only one providing care for students. I think it's also a very important um, thing to do is to designate a school liaison uh, person, either a diabetes educator or someone on your team to problem solve and answer questions from um, the, the school nurses. I think that's really important to um, do that because then they get familiar with that person and the school districts feel very comfortable contacting that person. person. Um, I think legal developments that may affect nationally or may affect your school district is important to know. You need to know what's going on. Um, Crystal usually keeps that information available, so you should check the website. And then um, we all would, would encourage you to identify school concerns early before this becomes problematic for your student. Unfortunately, um, you may be needed to act as an expert witness in support of litigation or other legal action. Many of us have done so. Crystal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, Fran, I'm having a little bit of a, the slides are being a little stubborn, but there we go. Oh, okay. okay, so this, this is the DMMP, just the front page. Um, this took many hours to develop with many of us adding different inputs. And I want you to notice the table of contents are very, very inclusive. I mean, this document has everything you could possibly need um, to um, support a child at school, including a disaster plan, which I think at this point is very important. If there's a lockdown at school, you need to be prepared for that. Um, my suggestion for you is to look at the different sections, as you can see, and go to the website to actually download or look at the DMMP. Unfortunately, and this is the case in my area as well, is that not every district will take um, uh, the, this, these school forms. And I think it is definitely our goal to um, have a unified DMMP for the whole country. And for example, we have to do Maryland school forms in one area, Montgomery County, and another in Prince George's County, and in another in Virginia, and another in, in DC in the district. So what I'm saying is get to know the school forms that you have to, or the DME plans that you have to fill out in your district. And then make sure if you can to, when you develop them, to look at ours from the DMMP and include them in your DMMP, because that is very, very helpful um, for the staff, as well as in formulations of the 504 plan. Crystal. Okay, so what are the our latest uh, updates in the DMMP? We really made an effort to um, have content that covers the full spectrum of diabetes therapies and approaches. And this includes not only the, what we would consider um, the appropriate, well, what we would consider as the current major form of um, uh, a treatment, which would be classic basal bolus therapy and maybe pump therapy, but also many children still use older forms of therapy, such as conservative split mixed insulin, et cetera, with sliding scale. So we need to put that down and there is a section to do so. So we want to make you aware that it is there. And we also have been very um, uh, detailed in, around using the our newer diabetes technology, including CGMs, insulin pumps, um, certainly the hybrid insulin pumps as well. We all have that in there. And it's very important that you go look at that to make sure that you have that information available. Again, emphasizing for it to be basis of 504 plans. Also, we wanted to have more precise use of carbohydrates in treating hyper, hypoglycemia when these students use diabetes technologies as one size does not fit all. Um, we ask that there be more comprehensive information for parent guardian section to make sure 
that um, we have a way to um, contact parents as well as the child's email and um, phone number as well. The um, uh, all day dosing information definitely must be available for overnight field trips and especially with disasters emergency care. We have a whole section on that. And then we condensed a one pager for medication section. If you need any more information, please go to the website. Everything is all there, including the DMMP and um, a sample 504 plan. Crystal. Okay. So as I've mentioned several times, and I keep mentioning it because it's really, really important, the com comprehensive filling out of the DMMP is the basis for a 504 plan or an IEP. And they, it has to be signed by the diabetes provider, um, either an NP or a MD. Um, and so that way you can also put down the needs that we met, including field trips and school sponsored activities. Or PA, forgive me, Emily, you're absolutely right. Anybody that is the ability to sign is perfectly included. So forgive me for leaving out PA. Um, okay, um, so the, the um, medical management divisions include emergency contact information. This is so important because um, uh, it, we have to be able to get um, to a parent and get them involved. And you know, we also include, I just, I'm seeing uh, chats popping up and I'm gonna address them if I can, is that we also have in the DMMP about um, sharing of information with um, CGMs with the parents. Um, basically, um, we want to be able to include provider, allowing parents to adjust insulin doses. We have many patients that, as I just mentioned, are sharing CGMs. We want parental involvement. We want them to understand the arrows in um, glucose monitoring and CGM, but I'm also gonna talk about what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate in schools. We wanna talk about glucagon administration, whether they're using um, glucagon IM or Baximi or, or GBOC or any nasal type of um, glucagon administration. There's a section in the DMMP about sports and adjustments, how to recognize highs and lows, um, how to do insulin administration, meal and snack schedules. And then Crystal, unfortunately, I can't see the last um, bullet point. Is there a way to show that? Uh, level of self-care. Okay, because sometimes the slide you know, is not totally aligned. Yes, so we have a section on levels of self-care, which can change throughout the school year. So that needs to be updated with the school nurse. If you find that a child has been totally reliant on nursing, um, helping with um, pens or pumps, and if they become independent, we really need to in, in, um, actually um, update that. Okay, so tips for completing DMMP. I have to say there have been times that if I'm rushing through it, it's not a good idea. You really need to go through all the section and be clear so that there's not any confusion for the school nursing or staff. Uh, we need to include specificity of timing, you know, before, after. Some families want you to indicate afterwards if their child's are picky eaters and you're, they're not sure of the carbohydrates um, they're eating. So make sure you be careful of that. And again, I want to reinforce about the level of independence. So if the child is able to do their own dosing, we want to make sure that the nurse doesn't get upset that they haven't appeared at the nurse's office. And then for CGM using patients, we need to be clear on alarm settings and when to respond. And again, this will be in the DMMP. And then lastly, as I mentioned, a liaison is really a good idea to be available for questions and troubleshooting. Okay, I'm gonna bring this up as a provider because I think this is incredibly important. Um, as you all know, we work with families and everyone is very different in terms of the following. Um, psychosocial and behavioral challenges accompany us, accompany us with every single child. In terms of the parent or guardian, emotional intelligence plays a huge role in how they're going to interact with, this, with the uh, school personnel. Sometimes there's too much or too little supervision. Parents can be very demanding, as you all know, um, and we need to set some limits. There's different parenting styles, and there's also um, the lack of cooperation between parent and guardians. We have patients that have, may live in two different households, and then there's just trying to get them to cooperate in terms of the management of their child's diabetes. The key, as everyone knows, is communication with the child, healthcare team, and school personnel. And it's very important to include the child, especially if they're independent, as part of this 
um, team. Now, the other thing I think is important to understand um, is, is the child and adolescent adherence in, ter adherence in terms of insulin regimen. Different children do, dif dif uh, do different regimens. As everyone knows, the more complex an insulin regimen, the more difficult it can be. So we need to understand that some kids do just do not feel comfortable with an insulin pump or don't want the device on them and that they may be on a different kind of insulin regimen. I've had some schools say they want everyone on a pump because it's easier for them. This is not about what's easier for them, it's about what's best for the student. Keep in mind that developmental stages play a, a huge role. A, the eight-year-old is very different than a 16-year-old. An eight-year-old is great. They want to please you and they want to do um, everything right to please you, the authorities. On the other hand, a teenager may be a little bit different, as you all know. The other thing is we have so many patients with other comorbid conditions, such as anxiety. Um, we have kids with psychiatric illnesses and a lot of kids with um, anxiety and depression. Uh, we need to be aware of kids who are on the autistic spectrum because we, um, there may be different needs that these children share. Okay, so again, I, again, as a provider, I want to um, discuss the, considering appropriate insulin regimens and nursing implications. Again, I, we feel that one size um, do not, does not fit all. And family stability and dynamics play a huge role in what the insulin regimen and cooperation with school personnel. You have to remember that daycare may play a role in this and different things may go on in school in a school setting than would be at home. And the other thing is you have to discuss when you're doing the DMMP, whether the child or adolescent can problem solve and how independent they are. And then the ability of the caregiver. We don't want people to do things that they're uncomfortable. So the RN or trained personnel to give injections or use the insulin pump should be trained by someone hopefully in your facility or at least someone in, in the area that is professionally trained to teach how to use a pump or CGS. I also would advise, look how adherent the child is to the regimen. We know kids fail to come to the nurse to get um, injections or doses. I think it's important for the staff to keep track of that. I would hope that um, the school will keep track of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia in order to let the parent know that an adjustment should be made. The school should not be making adjustments to the DMMP without contacting the parent and the provider. We just had a family that um, the school nurse called my team to say they're low and wanted to make adjustments without including the family the family was very unhappy and we needed to have a chat with the school. I also think it's important to let the school know about hospital admissions so that they're aware of the child's absence and why. And as I mentioned, the more complex the therapy, the more difficult it is to adhere to and for families to um, uh, be able to keep track of what's going on. Cost now is becoming a major issue in terms of insulin. So we need to be aware that some families are not able to afford some of these insulin. So that leads to insurance concerns. And I'm sure all of you are aware that we have people uh, working on trying to figure out which insulins go with which insurance plan. I have to say, and I'm gonna shout out for anyone on my team, I'm grateful for my refill team and pharmacists who help us figure out what to do because the insurance can change like day to day. The last thing is talking about accepted parameters. Um, with um, concerning um, uh, uh, health provider guidelines. We feel that parents are allowed to make incremental changes, meaning changes to insulin carb ratio, sliding scales, without having to document every little change to the school nurse. And on the school form, we give you abilities to put those parameters in the guidelines and the DMMP. So I also wanted to bring up, there was a study back in 2018, and since then there have been other studies, but this was one of the first one on the impact of um, uh, diabetes on cognition, development, and learning. As you all are aware, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia impacts ability to concentrate and learn. We also know that chronic hyperglycemia may lead to depression. Hyperglycemia in the classroom leads to interruptions for fluid consumption, bathroom breaks, as well as during exams. 
Hypoglycemia clearly needs immediate treatment, again, resulting in classroom interaction. In this study, um, they determined um, that DKA does indeed impair cognitive and function, cognitive function in children. They evaluated 144 uh, children between ages four to nine. Children who experienced a moderate or severe episode of DKA had significantly lower scores on continuous performance, IQ, and memory compared to those who had mild or no DKA. And there were changes in the white matter of the, and gray matter in the brain. I think you should look at other papers so that the point I'm bringing here is that frequent DKA and hypoglycemia can clearly cause issues in learning. So that's something for school nurses and teachers as well as parents to keep in mind. Okay. So once again, I'm saying your DMMP is the foundation for 504 plan development. And you as healthcare providers will be asked to provide a written confirmation of the diagnosis and an explanation based on evidence-based literature how diabetes adversely affects major life activity. I have, in, when I've had to defend a 504 plans, I've actually included references in the literature to support me. So I want you to be prepared for follow-up questions and to provide clarification of the need for these accommodations. And there's plenty of literature to support you. Okay, so what are the expectations of school nurse for utilization of technology? I don't know about you, but we get lots of pushback about nursing and um, other personnel about what um, is the appropriate way to deal with the technology. Keep in mind that expectations of parents and guardians and school personnel may differ. Remember, to a parent, their child is the most important and you know that that's what they're focusing on. However, Remember that the nurse has to take care of many, many children, not only those with diabetes, but other children with complex disease. So keep in mind, and you will notice that diabetes technology, CGM and pump, is becoming the standard of care as more children are combining CGM with pumps to resemble hybrid artificial pancreas. So remember that the, uh, currently we have the tandem um, control IQ system, which is a hybrid artificial pancreas with Dexcom, very shortly, and we already know this has been approved, the Omniped, Omnipod 5 will also become a member of the hybrid artificial pancreas group as currently is the Medtronic Minima. So keep in mind that in addition to these kinds of uh, technology, there's also the Freestyle Libre, which families use to monitor blood sugars as well. So school nurses will say that they have competing priorities. They will say they ha have a need for education and training um, all the time because things certainly change. Um, so our job as healthcare providers is to see that these nurses can get training either from our programs or from outside your hospital or program. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about unreasonable parent demands and that meaning the request for the nurse to constantly monitor CGM in addition to responding to alarms. We have to gently uh, work between the families and the st healthcare staff in school to come up with a negotiation because it's not a, a, parent, a school nurse cannot take the role of the parent in every different way. They must be, respond to safety alarms, but you can't expect them to be constantly looking to share with you every moment of the day. So how does the provider act? They should advocate for safety and cooperation between family and school. Adversity is not the way to go, it's cooperation. And that's why I'm gonna emphasize again, starting with the 504 plan before school starts when everyone is working together happily is the way to go. Next slide. Crystal? Okay. So again, I would recommend everyone to designate staff to respond to school related inquiries from school and parents. We know that, uh, that there are specific uh, personnel at schools that email my diabetes team or staff, and they love working with the same person because each of us get to know them well and can respond to their questions. We want them to be familiar with the DMMP and the needed accommodations for school. If you need help, we always have 1-800-CALL-DIABETES. And then the other thing is, which Crystal alluded to, if you keep finding identif and identifying recurring of problems, we may need to work with um, legal to work and change of a school policy and make it change in the state law, which has happened. Next slide, Crystal. 
All right, so as a healthcare provider, how can you be a training resource? Our hospital has worked with training of school staff, um, the school staff and nurses, and I'll get to that in a moment. We also have had uh, conferences where we provided updates to school nurses on new technologies. We have given them resources to support training of school nurses and personnel. We have actually been in, in children's has also done in-person training for our local school district. And I mentioned to be responsive to follow-up questions and work uh, with general training and diabetes tests. Key is to work to, with provider liaisons and school nurse to identify needing areas that require more training. Okay, once again, the goal is to get a safe, practical solution. Um, we also have to look at scope of practice, right? So school nurses and uh, non-medical personnel must be trained to provide diabetes care in schools with the absence of school nurse. I am aware that some of the non-medical personnel need to be supervised by a school nurse. So we're highly recommending to train two or three staff members in addition to a school nurse. It could be the, super, the secretary in the, in the nurse's office. It could be the secretary to the principal. It could be one of the uh, dietitians or school cafeteria people. And I wanna just once again, remind everyone that our parents are not healthcare personnel. We train them and they do a darn good job so when, when the nurse, when, when there's nursing personnel in school or administration saying we can't do that, I remind them that we train our parents and they do very well. Next slide. So remember, this is a 24 seven diabetes management is necessary for all people with diabetes, whether they're home and school and that children need to have good care to thrive academically. And lastly, in that area, when they're doing activities outside of the school, they need, to, they are, by law, are required to have someone who knows what they're doing, whether it be a school nurse or someone who's been adequately trained. Okay, so Crystal's listed for you. A, these are really excellent training resources, a school guide, which all of this is online, as by the way, this, this, uh, this, this discussion and visit with us is also online. So you shouldn't worry about taking notes if you miss something. And then we also have 1-800 and we also have state guidelines. Next slide. I wanted to briefly mention that, give you a practical example of what happened to Children's National Hospital in 2013. One of the patients that actually was not followed at Children's Hospital was required to go to school to care for a child with, with type one diabetes. And so she had to leave work threatening her job to go get shots. The parent wisely notified ADA legal department. As a result, through litigation, our Children's National Diabetes Team conducted two full seminars to train DC non-healthcare providers principal of diabetes management. We set up in, I don't even know where it was, it was downtown in a huge office building. We had different stations. We had um, I did pathophysiology. I had nurses do treatment of lows in carbohydrates, ingestion, glucagon. We had a table with technology where we demonstrate insulin pumps and CGMs. We had meters available. We um, were available for questions. And it really went well and everyone appreciated. Subsequently, they, we've been asked to come and do um, uh, basically uh, um, seminars for the DC public schools to go over the latest technology. We've done several of these programs for um, the Maryland people as well. Next slide. So the other thing is, again, I'm, as we, our job as health providers is to be an advocate. We may need to write a letter explaining why accommodations are needed and, and therefore give the medical basis for these accommodations. Feel free to use papers. And once they see a, a reference, they can't argue with it. It's evidence-based. And I would also encourage you to act as the medical expert in litigation or other legal processes. Our parents rely on us for this. Okay, I thought I would have, take a few moments to talk about COVID and type one. This has been a total nightmare for all of us in explaining how this affects our patients with diabetes. Because in the very beginning, there was very little literature to support um, what to do. So here are the facts. And I, 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 the reference was Children with Diabetes Network, but they had multiple other references. This is the latest update. Children and adolescents with type one diabetes are not at increased risk of contracting COVID-19. 
The risks of having severe COVID were mainly for people over 55 years of age, who with a higher BMI and microvascular complications increased the risk for admissions. Same thing with some of our patients. If they have a higher BMI and do have microvascular complications, which is sometimes associated with type two diabetes, there is increased of a risk of admission to ICU and risk of death. But this is uncommon with, type, with our patient population. I wanna support the fact that vaccines do reduce the risk of severe outcomes from COVID-19. Unfortunately, sadly, at this time, vaccines are only available for over five years of age, five and over. I wanna also say that um, unfortunately, they're finding that uh, immunity wanes for the younger age group, which they gave vaccinations for, you know, and you've read that I'm sure on your um, uh, emails, et cetera, but it still keeps them out of the hospital. There's just more increased risk of getting a mild case of COVID. We found that newly diagnosed people with type one have been in, in um, DKA greater than before the pandemic. This is, we don't know if this is because of having, having um, COVID. We've also seen a dramatic increase of 182% of new onset type two compared to years prior, especially in non-Hispanic use. And I'm wondering, is this related to the fact that they've been home at, um, you know, being, uh, doing more videos, doing virtual, um, uh, uh, school, uh, access to um, more snacks and that sort of thing. Next slide. Now, another thing that is not helpful, um, CDC um, um, uh, has uh, guidelines have not been consistent. There has been, I'm noticing a chat, I want to uh, clarify, there has been an increase of new diagnosis with type 2, two um, diabetes with COVID. I should also mention they are very, very sick. The ones that have come in uh, with COVID and type two diabetes have often been admitted to the ICU with both HHS and DKA, and that's been really scary. So thank you for that comment. Another thing I wanna point out is children with type one diabetes are not immunocompromised. Many of my patients have said, well, this is the excuse to get a vaccine. I said, I want you to get a vaccine anyway, but they are not immunocompromised. And I think that's very important to point out to our families. Confusing mask mandates which vary between school districts and states. So I, along with uh, Crystal and our other colleagues have the following suggestions. Get vaccinated if you're five or older. Make decisions after review of evidence-based data. I would like to strongly recommend reviewing COVID incidents in your area because the CDC recommendations have now changed based on how much the COVID is in your community. Mask, let's face it, masks do re decrease the risk of exposure. I would say use an N95 or KN95 if there is significant risk in your community. If the risk is decreasing, your community may allow cloth masks. I know in Montgomery County, which is where many of the kids go in DCC, they're talking about taking masks off outside. Soon they may be taking masks off completely. I will also say if someone wants to use a mask, no one is going to object to that. Next slide, please. So near, the, near in closing, I just want to say these are very important action steps to secure care and avoid discrimination. Prescribe school, prescribing school diabetes care regimen must be specific. You need to be very clear about medication schedules and dosages because nurses get very confused. That's why, and well, we will all would because things change all the time. That's why it's important to document carefully on the DMMP exactly what you mean so that there's less confusion. I also strongly recommend to try to um, authorize diabetes care by as many non-nurse school staff as possible. Have the school nurse delegate. Many of the school nurses are not at school. So if you can teach some non-school nurse basic stuff, that's fine. And if they run into a problem, they can call or text the school nurse for help. We need to protect patient privacy, privacy by keeping um, only as needed uh, information to the appropriate staff. Very important to determine the degree of self-care allowed um, based on students' knowledge of developmentals and abilities. That's gonna change constantly. We need to be aware of scope of practice. Um, some people are unable to, based on state laws or their community, to be allowed to do things. We want that to change so that everyone can be available to do self-care skills. Remember, for children, remember, parents 
are not healthcare providers and their scope of practice is to take care of their children. Um, we wanna be a problem solving resource to help meet student needs at schools. We are the patient's advocate. And then of course, we wanna be the ones to be able to train them to keep up to date on treatment trends so they don't just get information um, that is not reliable. Next slide, quickly. So I'm gonna just recap um, and finalize. We need to support school personnel. That is our job as advocates. Keep in mind, school nurses are the key coordinators and facilitators of care. The reality is, as I mentioned before, is that most schools do not have a full-time school nurse. So we must be able to delegate certain skills. We know unlicensed personnel may be trained to safely provide routine and emergency care. There, are, there is literature to support this. If you need it, we have, the, we have those papers. Federal and state laws provide protection for students with disabilities. I wanna remind you that um, the uh, Disabilities Act applies to people that get um, federal funding. That means if a religious school gets federal funding, they, uh, it applies to the Americans with Disability Act. The role of the provider as an advocate is determined school diabetes regimen. That is up to the school and the, I mean, the um, healthcare provider and the parent to tell the school what the diabetes regimen is, and that should be placed on the DMMP and to train the school personnel to understand what is in the DMMP as well as the 504 plan. Everything is on the Safe at School website. You should feel comfortable to look at it. We will also answer your questions. Uh, Crystal is very good about providing that information. There's also a legal team that can answer your questions as well. So this is the 1-800, as I joke, 1-800 call diabetes um, uh, uh, that you should call. And um, I'm seeing a chat from Doreen about the burden on the provider. Yes, it is a lot, it is tons of work. My staff starts getting very anxious around April. Even in April, next month, everyone's gonna be very anxious about filling the DMMP, but there has to be ways to go around that. Some of us do compute, some of them are on the computer online and, and that is probably the easiest way to go if you can get your DMMP form on, online and fill it out that way. Um, lastly, I, along with Crystal, I would like to thank you for joining us today. There's so much information that we provided and even more on the website. Please feel free to get to go to the website to get more information. And lastly, as a, as a, as a doc in Children's, I wanna thank all of you for taking care of our patients. We need to be their advocates as we admire all the work they have to do on a 24 hour basis. And please, uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for joining us today and feel free to ask any questions. Um, yes, I, Dr. Kogan, I just wanna add my thanks to you. Um, for presenting and also to everyone who attended today. And our uh, colleague, Natalie, I think is gonna read, we're gonna take a few minutes to um, read and try to answer some of your questions. I know we're running a little bit over, but uh, for those of us who can stay on for a few minutes, that would be great. So Natalie, would you mind? Absolutely. Um, so we had a question here. It's mostly asking for your opinion. Um, opinion on sending a five-year-old to a Head Start program uh, funded locally when no nurse is on site. The child is on an insulin pump and CGM um, and the staff feel it is too much for them. What's your opinion? Well, ab absolutely. Um, Non-medical personnel, the staff at Head Start can be trained. Um, and that's where the provider comes in. The provider, the diabetes healthcare provider can come in to help train the Head Start staff, preschool staff, kindergarten staff. And also Head Start will have certain obligations under federal law to make sure there is someone who has been trained uh, who can take care of that child. So it doesn't necessarily require a nurse to provide care is what I'm saying. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, my son's school keeps threatening for him to not be able to ride a bus home or to school if he does not have his bag that includes his meter, candy, extra lancet, and glucagon. He is on a pump and a CGM. The school nurse has an extra meter and everything she might need if such a bag, if something from the bag is missing. Is this legal for them to do? Well, I would just work with the school nurse um, and have the school nurse with work with transportation to make a decision about 
you know, what is best practice and what, what is safe and what is available to that student to make sure the student does have all the needed supplies. So I think it's just probably gonna be a matter of education and, and the school nurse and the, the uh, transportation person working together to make those decisions along with the parent. Thank you. Uh, next question. Do these laws cover a child at a private school? Yes. Um, private schools have legal obligations under Section 504 if they receive federal funding. Um, if they do not receive federal funding and they are not operated by a religious entity, the private school does ob has obligations under the Americans with Disabilities Act and should still have a written accommodations plan. Uh, next question, does a student with diabetes have to have a 504 plan? And what if the family doesn't want one? I'll, I'll have to take that one, Crystal. Um, we get that all the time and they do not have to have a 504 plan. And I'm, I'm just emphasizing, I would encourage the provider to encourage them to have a 504 plan when things are going well, because then when you're in the midst of an adversarial um, challenge with either the school nurse or the principal, things can get very heated. And then they say, well, you don't need a 504 plan because we've got everything down in the DMMP. So I would encourage them in the very beginning when everyone is, before even school starts, to encourage them to do a 504 plan and tell the, the nurse or the principal that this is not adversarial. This is meant, it's recommended by the provider and, and all that. So they don't look at it as a negative thing. Crystal, go ahead and add. I'm just saying. No, no, Fran, you know, I, I think of the 504 plan as being a proactive instrument rather than reactive. So let's put it, let's put it in writing. We need to put the accommodations in writing. Um, if, it, if, if it was, if it's not in writing, it didn't happen, was never said. Um, does the child, is the child still protected under 504 without a plan? Absolutely. But it's, ADA recommends and we prefer, uh, is preferred best practice to always have a 504 or another written accommodations plan, absolutely. Thanks, next question. Are before and after school programs offer, offered through a public school covered by a 504 plan? Yes. And next question. Should teachers and those with full-time roles in the schools unrelated to school health be expected to provide direct care? Okay, I'll take that one. It depends, okay? I, I think it's the same thing as not um, uh, healthcare personnel. I think a teacher at minimum should be able to, if they see someone, you know, like there's an alarm going off, I think they can at least um, see what's going on. The main thing I want to point out is if the child needs to be treated for a low, they should not just send the child say, okay, Johnny, go to the nurse's office. They need to send someone with Johnny to go to the nurse's office to get help. So at the minimum, I think uh, I always recommend to my families, especially if it's like um, um, uh, elementary school where they're in the classroom with the teacher all day to know the basics of diabetes, meet with the teacher beforehand, they're happy to know this. They want their children to be safe. So just tell them the basis. I don't expect them to understand the intricacies of working with an insulin pump or a CGM. And, and you know, yeah. most people know yeah. someone who has diabetes, a family member, a loved one. Um, I know with my own child, I was very pleasantly surprised um, that many of the teachers had uh, knowledge, had skill level. Of, of providing diabetes care because they had a family member with diabetes. So don't forget about that. Thank you. Next question, is the DMMP, should it be updated at least every school year? Yes, so things, things change every year. I mean, as I was saying, one of the important things is independence. You may have had a fifth, fifth grade, uh, uh, kid in fifth grade that relied moderately on um, you know, nursing to give them injections. And then the next year they're totally independent. So we, we do an individual healthcare plan should do every single year. And um, which include um, any changes in, because their, their insulin regimen may have been changed. Someone may have gone from a classic basal bolus therapy to an insulin pump. 
some schools just want to do a health plan instead of a 504. Is that okay? You need both. Student needs both. The health plan is a plan that addresses the diabetes management needs, what, what needs to be done during day, but the 504 written accommodations plan, think of it as a, a legally uh, binding agreement between the family and the school. And again, it's important to put all of those services in writing um, that are agreed upon by the 504 team. And let's take maybe two more questions and then we will we'll wind down. So Absolutely. I wanted one more add on to that. When we do newly diagnose patients, I believe our educators talk about both the DMMP and the 504 plan. So it should be sort of just that's routine. I think that should be like anybody who's diagnosed with diabetes and going to school should think of them as a together plan. Uh, I have a first grader with type 1 diabetes, and it was recommended by his doctor that he have a one-to-one -one aid as he doesn't feel what, as he doesn't feel good when his glucose is dropping. This was refused by administration. Is this legal? I don't think it's a good idea, but I don't know if it's legal, Crystal. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm only aware of one school district in the country that provides one-to-one uh, -one para. Um, the best practice is to train a small number of school staff who are responsible for the child. Maybe it's the homeroom teacher, or maybe it's a specialist teacher, but um, to train a small group of school staff who can provide care to that child um, in the absence of a nurse. And final question, um, is this presentation going to be available online? Yes. Yes, it will be available on our website and you'll see that we'll soon be promoting it through ADA social media channels. So be on the lookout for that and please feel free to share. Wonderful, we do have more questions coming in but I believe that's the time. Okay, well, thank okay. you everyone for attending and be sure to thank check out the resources online at, at diabetes.org forward slash safe at school. Thanks so much and have a great weekend. And thanks for all that you do. Yes, thank you.